Welcome to the Unlicensed Podcast. As always, I'm Caleb. We've got Tassus over here. Hello. And this week, we are joined by Adair Money himself. Adair Winter, AW Broadband <laughs> from Amarillo, Texas. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. <laughs> Ready to spread the love. So, yeah. Uh, Adair's been at this a long time. A lot of you guys know him out there. So we're going to hop into it in a second. But before we get started, as always, Toss says, give the good people out there their call to action. Absolutely. Don't forget to like, listen, and subscribe to our channel right here on YouTube or anywhere you download your audio podcast like Apple or Spotify. Adair, hey, again, so Adair Winter, AW Broadband, Amarillo, Texas, uh, we're super happy that you joined us, took time out of your busy day to talk to us, so if you don't mind, uh, give everyone kind of a quick introduction, who you are, uh, a little bit about the history, uh, how you decided to get into this uh, wonderful WISP life that we all live, and uh, we'll kind of go from there. Sure, yeah, so we started, gosh, it's been about 13 years ago, Um Kind of that typical story, you know, started in the garage, started small, started with no money, kind of, you know, bootstrapped it all the way up from from there to where we are today. Um, I mean, legitimately, were was just started in those early days with just, you know, a couple of customers a week installed, maybe and tower work in the evenings and weekends and that kind of stuff. So, I mean, it's just very typical you know, I start with startup, I guess, if you will, and um, have turned it into, you know, um, what it is today. And it's been really good as far as, you know, like us, us being able to find good team members and keep stuff going. But, um, you know, in the early days, we did it all, you know, I was doing tower work, I was doing uh, installs, all the network work and the whole nine yards. So it's really great to have a good team behind us now who can take care of a lot of that kind of stuff. And, and we get to kind of do fun stuff like this and hang out with you guys. Um, I don't know, uh, how deep we want to go into anything else, but that's that's the majority of it. We can cut that out probably. So <laughs> <laughs> now we're here. We're we're here to talk about as much as you want to, uh, as many details as you want to share or uh, hide. Yeah. You know, you get the competition peeping on you, so yeah. you don't have to feel forced to divulge any industry secrets or anything <laughs> like that. So you know, we're just here to to talk. And again, this is you know, this is where other operators learn about you know the differences. There's there's, there's as many different type of WIS networks or hybrid networks or whatever uh, as there are operators and there's conditions like you know with your part of the state i've been out there i've never seen a, a flatter place in my life right so you know <laughs> you've got a set of advantages there but it could also be really big challenges especially when you talk about noise propagation or something like that yeah. right so you know being able to talk some details about what makes your you know challenges unique to you you know there's there's shared problems there's shared things that we all are facing but you know we can dig in as deep as you want to go. This is this is your platform to talk and share your experience. You know, you've got a wealth of information. So yeah, to that to that point, I mean, um, you know the um, the the flatness around here is is both a blessing and a curse. Like you mentioned, you know, um, I I am actually really glad that we don't have the tree problem. I think that is that is worse. But um, the flatness and and the uh, all the um, self interference is a huge problem so then you 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 stack that on top of two or three other wisps in the area and things can get interesting in a hurry so it really makes us i guess have to um uh be more creative and i think that's it was part of a, a natural progression for us to kind of get um f- to transition from the wisp space into not just being a wisp but but just being an isp and that's where cable has come from we we purchased a couple of cable plants uh gosh it's been 5 five years six years ago now and um uh now uh, probably in the same amount of time five six years we started deploying fiber um you know and everybody says fiber is great and it doesn't have you know it just works but it has its fair share of problems too and so we've had to you know learn all of those challenges over the years to try to figure out you know what we what what stuff we need and how we troubleshoot those networks and they're a completely different um you know completely different animal we actually just had a recent issue with our fiber plant where um right in the middle of the football game the other night of uh, like 7:42 p.m. 
we had a fiber outage, 75 customers offline, and somebody actually shot our fiber. We found that it was actually had been hit with a uh, shotgun pellet. So whether that was from dove hunting or whatever, um, I don't know. But we, we put light on it, and we were driving down the road, and you could just see it clear as day up on the strand, just shining. So that was something our team had to work on from around you know 8, 8 p.m. till about 1 a.m. and got it resolved and got everybody back up. But couldn't have picked a worse time for it to happen. So it's always, a, always fun out there. Yeah, no matter what you're going to do, there's always going to be shenanigans out there, busting stuff and whatever else. So I'm always fascinated, too, with the fibers getting shot. Like, because it, it's not an uncommon thing. It's rare, but, I mean, it happens. And then you start thinking about, you know, something like that. How many times is your fiber or your radios or whatever getting shot at before it actually hits, right? And you just don't know about it, yeah. <laughs> you just don't know about it until one pellet finally makes its way through. So, yep. Uh, okay, so let's kind of talk about so the the technical evolution, I guess, of the the wireless side. We'll we'll talk yep. about that a bit, uh, and then we'll definitely get into the fiber uh, and stuff like that. So on the wireless side, when you guys got started out, I mean, what were you primarily using? Just five gig unlicensed, like a lot of players were in that space. Was it Canopy, Ubiquity, a mix, or yeah, we really started with Ubiquity and five gig. I mean, because twelve, thirteen years ago, I mean. Um, that was, I mean, Ubiquity was probably, I mean, Cambium was out there, um, but I suspect we were probably had a feeling that we can't afford that necessarily, so we kind of found what, what worked. Um, now we're actually, we have, we deploy a lot of Cambium in our network, but it's uh, we had to kind of grow up into it and, and not having any kind of financial backing in the early days. Um, those, those four that owned it were literally just taking money out of our pocket and just enough to buy equipment. And so a lot of ubiquity gear, it was all five gigahertz. It's over the years we've, you know, we finally tried other things like three gigahertz and 2.4. And I think we bought one piece of 900 meg equipment at one point in time, but, uh, <laughs> never really deployed it. We just didn't, just didn't really end up needing it, you know, cause luckily because we don't have a lot of trees, we don't really have a lot of issues with, uh, needing you know the tree penetration and of course after as things evolved three gigahertz really kind of became our go-to equipment for doing that and we did that with telrad in the early days like starting in like 2015 or something which i'm, I'm kind of glad lte's gone for my network not just telrad in general but lte in general and uh, but still run a lot of three gigahertz you know running 450ms on three gigahertz and and still st- delivery to those few people that are behind the trees you know it's as flat as it is and as few trees as there are we still end up with that one customer that's always got you know the tree in the way <laughs> and they got to figure out a way to get them and it's typically in in the small town where there it's it's been developed for a while and there's a lot of uh, a lot of um you know trees just right in town and then we'll put up one sector to cover the town and then everything else is five gig around it and that was pretty much kind of how we kind we got started was just uh finding those areas of town uh that didn't have good service i mean they legitimately either had nothing or dsl or some other you know older is uh wisp and we kind of just built on top of that and built more and more as we could and and i think today we probably support over a thousand ap's in the year and Wow. Miles and miles of fiber. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. I know you guys were doing at least at one point, a lot of those sort of smaller micro pops again, using the, the terrain and stuff, you could get to an area and put up a, you know, a 50 foot stick or something and get a good relay out of that. Yeah. We had a, we had an interesting decision to make. I don't know. Again, this was a lot of pivotal stuff happened five or six years ago where it was kind of like, do we bite the bullet? And I think at the time we were just even looking at 450i, maybe 450m. And uh, I was like, do we spend the money and convert a bunch of the uh, big towers? We had some towers with like 600 users on them, 600 plus users on them. And it's like, do we, do we transition to something that we can maybe use, utilize the spectrum more efficiently, uh, uh, effectively, or do we start like building micro pops and getting closer to the customer? And really the answer was for us getting closer to the customer. So yeah, we ended up building, gosh, I don't even know, probably 20 or 30 small 50 to 70 foot towers in different places where we deployed, um, equipment and and in, in particular, I think that's really where we got our our good feel for running horns because it was nice because we could put up these small towers yep. and we could put the you know a smaller have a smaller footprint at the top of this tower by putting you know horns up there instead of having a giant sector and you know shield kits and all that kind of stuff that we used to have to run back in the early days, which was good stuff. It, it did help us, but it it, it 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 you know you don't necessarily want to put it on the top of a sixty foot freestanding tower. Uh, all the time and so those uh, it was you know you leveraging all of those little 
you know, things, whether uh, different pieces of equipment all from all the vendors to to try to just get as close to the customer as possible and give them the service that they really wanted was was the name of our game. And we've been pretty successful at that, luckily. I think it's worked out well. Um as we've gotten older in the WISP industry, you know, we, we can afford more expensive equipment. And so now we deploy that where it makes sense. But we're still very focused on, hey, if I can put a if I can put up a small tower and a couple of, you know, ubiquity APs on it and serve some customers, let's do it. You know, they're going to be just as happy on that as they are a $7,000, you know, AP from somebody else, you know. So, you know, right tool for the right job, you know, and then where it makes sense, we're, we're, we're overlaid fiber on top of it. And some of our, I've actually probably decommissioned, I don't know, three or four network sites or tower sites in the last couple of months because they're completely overbuilt with fiber and we've moved everybody off of them. So it's been a really interesting transition from, you know, trying to figure out how to be the provider on wireless to how do we continue to stay relevant with, with a fiber game, Yeah, which is Especially significantly more expensive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that a micro pop kind of scenario, you know, I, I know back in the day, a lot of people were trying to do that with like anchor homes, they would call it, right? You'd try and find somebody within the neighborhood that you'd make the anchor, put up some small antennas like our symmetrical 90s or something and create relays. You're talking about putting up small towers, which is fantastic, but I think people might be interested in like, how, how do you work that out, right? I mean, you obviously don't own the land, you know, what kind of agreements or how do you, how do you work it out in order to find these sites and then uh, put up these little micro pops and stuff like that in that scenario. Yeah, I mean, usually in those cases, it's, it starts like anything. Where's the highest point in the area that, that's going to make the most sense? You know, sometimes being on uh, the, right in the middle of the of an area doesn't make sense. You know, it just depends on, on landfall and whatever. And so you're like, do I get off to one side? And so it really just starts with really kind of being very familiar with your coverage area and knowing the, the, the topology and terrain. And we use all kinds of maps to kind of help figure that out. Where's, where can we best place this to get the most bang for our buck kind of a thing. So that's the, that's the first thing we have to identify is just where do we have to go in order to service these customers correctly. And, um, once we've kind of figured that out, what we like to do is find somebody who's already a customer because we have a relationship with those people. And yep. so then we can know, knock on their door and say, hey, <laughs> you know, we want to build a tower on your property. And luckily, the, the vast majority of our network is is rural. And so we're typically going into an area that, you know, doesn't have a lot of restrictions, you know, because we're in a, and we're in a city or whatever. And so basically, you know, if, as long as we have a, a, get a contract in place with the landowner or homeowner, then, you know, we're pretty much free and clear at that point to, to build a tower. We do even have a few roof mounted, uh, tripods, you know, on homes that just serve a, a, a small area. Uh, there's one just down the road for me. It's on a two story house. It's like, why build a tower when it's already there? And they've, they were yeah. okay with putting it up. And typically our deal is we'll just give you free internet, you know? Right. And they're like, cool, I get free internet. And, you know, basically they're, they become a part of the backbone of the network. And so it's probably better service than they ever had before, you know, and, and we're going to be on top of it if there's an outage and it's kind of a win-win all the way around. So it's a pretty typical story, you know, that you hear people do do this stuff, but we really do put a lot of thought and effort into trying to say, okay, you know, where's the best spot? How, what can we get, you know, uh, where can we get the most customers out of this? And those kinds of things really are the very beginning. And then the, usually the contract, you know, is, is the easier part of it. Because if somebody doesn't want to do it, we'll just go to their neighbor, you know, or whatever the case is, and uh, we won't really fight it too much. And, um, you know, the, our, our biggest struggle probably has been in those scenarios has been people, you know, selling their home, somebody new yeah. coming in. They're usually pretty good about it because they're like, I, I want internet, you know, hey, this this thing has, stays here. I think we've had one one person over the years that said, um, I don't really like this tower here. And it's like, well, this right. contract still stands. So you and you basically bought it when you bought the house. So <laughs> it's going to stay. But, you know, you have to kind of get them used to the idea of it or whatever the case may be. And and on just typical challenges after that, just keeping everything running. But it, it's been kind of interesting as we transition away from wireless a little bit into more of the fiber market. You know, it's kind of like sometimes sometimes these these um, these little sites become not a not a burden but you know just eliminating them over time is nice because now you got less battery backups for, to replace batteries in and just one less uh you know blip on a radar for an outage that might happen you know uh even if it's during a rainstorm or something like that because we've we've gotten to where we use a lot of 60 gig for back backhaul and we typically back it up with something else but you know you'll see a blip if it drops out or something like that so you know just one less thing to have to worry about that the tower crew doesn't have to go, oh God, here we go. I got to go out and go fix something. <laughs> so, 
Yep. Yeah, the the more cogs you can pull out of the machine, you know, it, it helps a lot. Um, and what you said about contracts is super important. You know, that's one of the things that you see when people are moving from a, you know, a, a startup, really sort of small shop to a larger operation and, and not having those contracts in place can really burn you. You know, it's really important to have those for those relay sites. And even if they don't have a lot of teeth in them or anything like that, just having something legally defined on a piece of paper means so much in the long run. So I think that's definitely something that people don't think about or they forget about until they get burned a good time or two. Then they're like, oh yeah, yeah. we should probably do this. So. I was just going to say to learn as you get burned, you know, <laughs> We've gotten bit before. We did a lot of those, you know, handshake agreements with somebody, and then they sold the house, and we're like, "Oh, maybe we should have had a contract on that." And so we're circling back around with the new people, going, "Hey, we really want to keep this here. And what do we got to do to keep things copacetic?" You know, and it yeah. usually works out pretty good. But um, I've actually, we've actually had more problems with commercial sites and getting kicked off of them than we have with you know smaller residential sites. But um, there's definitely a challenge with supporting you know more smaller sites too. You know, I mean, definitely comes with some overhead. So I guess one way or the other, you're putting in work. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of conversation, man. We've done with people and internally and stuff. You know, my, macro pops versus micro pops. I mean, the dream is you take one set of equipment, you put on the tower, and you serve all your thousands of subs from it, and so on and so forth. And there are equipment sets where that is feasible, whether you're running big arrays or Toronto or whatever you may be doing. But you know, there's a lot of limitations in terrain, and you can get through some trees and stuff, but you're not shooting through the dirt in any of it, right? And you know, this is where the the WIS tool in the toolbox approach is really coming into effect where you've got to be agile and adaptable and say, look, if I've got to serve these people, how am I going to do it? And now when we start seeing six gig really start taking off, you know, the limitations on six is, you know, it's great. But in reality, the, the lower you can have those six gig sites, so you're not having as many AFC issues. You're limited on ERP, so you're not getting those, you know, eight and 10 mile ranges like you used to way back in the day. So there's yeah. a lot of consideration with that. And I think the 60 gig stuff has really come in to help sort of support those sites. So you could run, you know, a gig plus of traffic without having to necessarily rely on fiber or having to put up a license link, you know, until the 60 gig stuff took over. If you wanted a reliable one or two gig link, you know, you're either licensed or you're, you're hoping and praying with a wide five gig channel, which doesn't make sense in a lot of places. Yeah. I think there's a lot also. There's a lot also to consider in the, uh, you know, micro pop versus, let's say, mega pop, the tower with a thousand subscribers on it. You know, you could also have a single point of failure, too, where, you know, something goes down and all of a sudden you have a thousand customers offline, you know, versus having, you know, a, a small micro pop go down. You have maybe a dozen or less customers that go offline until you fix it. So there's there's some risk to reward and balance that, you know, has to go with that as well a very real challenge yeah. um we've got a, a a tower site it started as a tower site it was our very first tower site actually but it's also been our, our one of our major fiber head ends and it i think we hit eight gigs on our backhaul the, a couple of right. nights ago yeah. and it's only got a 10 gig feed and so now we're like okay what's our next step here for uh getting you know more traffic here and so we've got a plan and we're gonna we're gonna add some equipment to increase the redundancy uh, for all of it really but it'll get us more capacity there in the long run but all that to say um, it it scares me to no end like what if that site goes down because now we're yeah. not talking about 10 people offline we're talking about 1200 people offline or something yeah. crazy like that you know and so you really have to there's a lot of engineering and thought that has to go into designing uh, a larger site too because you know so that's why our network looks like a spider web of all these redundant links because even if i just have a small tower out there with 10 or 20 people on it people have become so dependent on the internet that even a even a small outage of that site is 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 huge for them you know or they think yeah. it is anyway you know you want to yeah. say go do a puzzle but you know they're they want to be like oh my god i can't do anything at my house you know so <laughs> whatever the world You'll stops be spinning oh my god <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it just it highlights the point that even you know large large and small sites alone. I mean, it's very important to build a, a good solid network with as much redundancy as you can. But like you mentioned, I mean, you're you're there's cost constraints. License backhauls are expensive. Sometimes yep. they're too big to put on towers or or, or site you know uh, smaller sites, whatever they may be, rooftops or whatever. And then there's challenges with 60 gig. Now you got to back it up because it may rain fade and all kinds of stuff. So it definitely keeps you on your toes. But, you know, none of it, none of it's easy. Um, that's why I guess we all, I guess that's why we're doing it, right? We like the challenge of trying to figure all that stuff out. I love the saying is like, we, we do this not be, 
not because it was easy, but because we thought it was easy. It's, it's really <laughs> kind of true. <laughs> yeah, I can't be. This is no big deal. I'm, I'm right? pretty sure that's not how the saying goes, but okay. <laughs> well, okay. Correct me then. <laughs> you're right. I think you're. Yeah. I think you are. I did get it wrong, but well, yeah, it, that, it just highlights the fact that there's just a lot to do. There's always something to do. Every day is yeah. a new day for us. Yeah, and it's like everyone, you know, especially when they're new, you're like, oh my goodness, I can get this data over this distance with wireless. This is easy. And you hyper focus on just the wireless side, right? But as you build and scale, you know, so much of it really comes down to all the the nitty gritty bits, like your power distribution, your backup, standardizing sites, uh, so that when you know your tech rolls out there, you don't have to rely on the one guy who built it eight years ago to remember like what this random wire out pattern was or whatever else. There's so, so that, much of that that I see, man. <laughs> there's so, yeah, there's so much of that that I've done, right? So yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so don't tell on yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there's no better saint than a previous sinner. So yeah, you know. But, you know, those are definitely falls into the, the growing pain sort of things, too. So now the resources, though, are so much more available. And I think that the community as a whole shares that information way better. I mean, yeah. when you guys started, there was no, you know, aggregated point and then or people would do it. But they were trying to keep all their secrets to themselves because they were yeah. you know hyper worried about competition and stuff. And I think the the industry as a whole has you know, to, to some good extent move to, uh, Hey, you know, this is how we're standardizing. This is how we're doing stuff because, you know, all raising boats, blah, 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 metaphor, so on and so forth. So, you know, I, I think that's it. And then there's also just been a lot more sort of standardization, you know, alpha is like ICT really supporting the industry. You've got more access to high quality cabinets and backup power systems and oh, 100%. You know, lithium battery backups and, Stuff like that where, you know, you've got the ability to make a better site, a more redundant site. And then as we sort of enter this new age of hyper competitiveness where, you know, it used to be, well, I'm the only rural player out there. And now, you know, as bead rolls out and all this government money funds in, you know, these rural guys even are finding scenarios where they're competing against not just one other player, a Comcast or a Spectrum or whoever. But now you're com- and, and they're, they're generally crap. But now you're competing against a lot of these new fiber ups stars and stuff like that so you know it's a message that we rely that we harp on and repeat so much is like you know the better your network runs the more redundant it is the more stable it is you know it's not just the speed this is the answer speed is an important part of it capacity so on and so forth but making sure it works and making sure that you can provide a good quality service to your area i mean that's really what keeps you going as we enter this new age and you know see where it all winds up and you make you bring up a good point. You know, I mean, there's a standardization goes a long ways, and we I think we've done. Uh, it's really where the Adair money thing came from, and maybe that's an interesting spin. There's probably some people that want to know why why that that yeah, they're like, what are you talking about, you cocky jokers? So. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> the, the I mean, the, but in the earlier days, I mean, we're talking. I don't know, 2014, 2015, that's kind of when that, that showed up. I can't believe it's still going on, honestly. Yeah. Um, but, uh, as, you know, we were trying to build sites right, you know, and so we were buying these American products, mini fort cabinets, try to make them all pretty much the same, um, you know, so it was a net tonic switch and a, a Amprod cabinet and, you know, the same battery backup and the same batteries. And, you know, we were just trying to make things look nice. We were trying to get away from that stigma, I guess, that in, the industry had of, oh, I could throw something in a uh, Rubbermaid tote and yeah. set it on top of a grain elevator and call it yeah. a tower site. Yeah. I won't name any names, but we did see that a few places around here. And I know the pictures have rolled across <laughs> off online. Um, it's it's a reality that I think a lot of us had to get over. Um, and we had even some uphill battles with some one of the legacy wisps in the in, in, in the industry. They've just been around so long, you know, that uh, they had a lot of sites and they they kind of ticked some people off along the way. And so we'd come knocking on a door saying, "Hey, we want to, we want to use your site to provide service." And they're like, "Absolutely not! I don't want anything to do with this wireless internet stuff." You know, so we had challenges in the early days of of just all i mean everything whether it was just the availability of equipment i don't think we were we don't we didn't have the challenges that matt larson had you know doing this 20 years ago trying to literally build you know uh, radios and put stuff together and run lmr 400 i i, I was a, i was around during those days but we were doing different stuff with that kind of equipment and i'm just, i'm glad we didn't have to do it you know is you know all ethernet and pretty well self-contained and packaged up and it was it was a lot easier than some of those guys had had to deal with but, you know, we were trying to kind of, I guess, help, help mold the industry a little bit, probably somewhat unknowingly. We were just 
doing something that we thought looked good and thought would work and thought would last a long time and we're just showing everybody. So going back to your previous point about in the early days, we didn't have as much of a support system as we do now. Yeah, there was no wisp talk, you know, yeah. uh, 10 years ago. Uh, I do kind of, I guess, miss the Ubiquity forums and even the Microtik forums. I mean, that's where I got my information. I mean, legitimately, that's how I learned. I mean, DSL I knew enough reports. about... <laughs> yeah, and in fact, it, some of that, you know, I mean, so that's really where I learned a lot of information. I knew a little enough networking to be dangerous, but I didn't know how to be an ISP. And so it was gleaning information from a lot of those people. And I, I kind of missed those days and then started being the one putting out information to people and saying, hey, here's what we're doing. I mean, I, I've gone back and seen some 10 year old posts that I posted on the Ubiquity forums about how to do MPLS and OSPF and all those, those kinds of things. And then I've, I've gone through and found messages in my Facebook Messenger where people are reaching out saying, hey, I found your your post on the Ubiquity forum from eight years ago. Yeah. I have a question, you know, and, and I think those things are kind of cool to, to to help be one of those people that I'm not going to call myself or our company an industry leading company by any means, but to feel like maybe you have a little bit of impact in the industry overall, whether that is just with how we built our network or how we standardize our sites or whatever. But the whole dear money thing really came about because of, of that stuff right there. It looked like we were spending money on our network and we were, I mean, we were investing in the network because a lot of those sites are still running. They're still in the same cabinets, but you know, the equipment's probably changed two or three times at this point we've added and, and, and decreased, you know, equipment over the years. But for the most part, it's still very consistent. And I think that is a, a key part of why we've probably been so successful is that we, we found a standard while still being flexible, you know what I mean? Like it don't always have to be like, well, if it doesn't fit in our cookie cutter mold, we're, it's trash, right? So it's kind of like, well, you know, we've got a way we want to do it, but let's still be flexible with it. Yeah. And I remember that kind of transition, right, in the industry where it went from super frugal, right, to like, hey, you know, time is money too, right? And obviously you guys saw that, that there was cost savings on the back end by standardizing things, uh, not, you know, inventorying, you know, uh, less skews because you standardized and yes it looked like you were flexing and look at this guy spending all this fancy money <laughs> you look know at, look at this fancy generator oh, yeah. must be nice yeah, 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 yeah it's clean it actually starts the first time you know you know so so yeah i yeah exactly i kind of i kind of remember that transition going from wisp were extremely frugal because it was so diy to like now stuff was you know polished and prepared and pretty and you looked you know not you right but people who kind of started transitioning yeah it, when the industry transitioned you know kind of looked like well these are the the money guys it's like no you just you know saw that things were changing and you got on board before everybody else so Absolutely. And I feel like anymore, we're, we're maybe a little less um, on the edge or out in front of everybody as we used to be. Uh, sometimes the, I feel like we got we got cut on the bleeding edge, you know, uh, uh -huh. sometimes of trying to always try every little thing. Because I, I tell people we have a mutt network. We've got a little bit of everything. And we've kind of had to rein that back in. Like, okay, it's not good <laughs> to have, you know, every vendor's equipment out there all the time. But if you don't try it, you don't really know either. And so I've certainly always been willing to try something but some of it has stuck you know stuck in the network and some of it has it you know and and i think that's okay as long as you're willing to uh you know as long as it doesn't sink the ship as you're going i guess you know then you got to be that's part of us i think being flexible you got to give it a try if it doesn't work be willing to say hey that, that doesn't really work for us so we're trying something different yep for sure, for sure. And, you know, plus two is that you've got to keep in mind the sort of scalability. You know, I think one of the common traps that people, because, I mean, even now you see this new gener, I mean, I say new generation, you know, a, a lot of these players that are now, you know, three to five years in, they've been able to really take off, you know, with all this groundwork sort of being done, they could take off running with it. But, you know, you've got to think about you're not going to be just the guy forever. You're, you know, as you build and grow this thing, you're going to have to scale it. And with that comes, you know, it eventually turns into you go from being the guy who keeps everything running to the guy who's running the business. So you've got to be able to build systems that are repeatable, reliable. You can do support on them and stuff, standardize where you can, because otherwise you're just going to end up spending your whole life putting out fires instead of, well, I mean, putting out fires of the part of running the business itself. So you're trading one set of issues for another, but you've got to be able to bring people in and train. And we all know how hard it is to, to find staff and to bring them in. 
in and and things like that. So, and I think we've been very fortunate fortunate that we've we have been able to find a good leadership team who you know has been around for a long time. A lot of a lot of our employees have been here eight to eight and ten years, um, and and a few of them you know. Uh, on the leadership team even. So we have some front office staff that have been around that long. We've got people on the leadership team that have been around that long, maybe even more. I can't even, I have like maybe even 10 or 11 years since, you know, some of the original, we have some original employees that started with us and the, you know, whenever we were originally hiring, when we started, you know, probably early 2012 kind of a thing or 2013 that are still here today, you know? And so we've been very fortunate that we've been able to find a good team of people I can't tell you how many conversations I'm a part of where people are like, how do you find good people? How do you hire good people? You know, and I, I don't, I can't, I can't ever really answer the question. Like, I don't, I don't feel like we had to really work that hard at it, but I also feel like, um, we maybe uh, kind of one of our, one thing that we did do pretty well at is, is finding a good leadership team and people who are willing to kind of go that extra mile who are probably doing the majority of the work finding those the you know pe- replacement people today, and so it's not falling back on us um, as as the owners of the company necessarily to to have to be completely involved in those steps. So it probably I'm probably oversimplifying our our labor, but it's at at the same time we don't have a lot of turnover, and I'm really proud of the team that we've been able to build. I mean we do we do almost everything in house. I mean. Right, wrong, or indifferent. You know, I mean, that's everything from electrical to HVAC to, you know, tower installs, to the whole nine yards, fiber, all of our fiber builds and everything. So all of our installs and everything, we don't contract anything out because I feel like we get a better control over our product, our end product. And the, hopefully the customer has a better experience. Sure, there's been a learning experience to some of it or a learning curve to some of it where, you know, I thought this was supposed to work better than this. And then we find out we did something wrong and we have to go correct our mistake and, you know, but it's been, uh, it doesn't matter what the technology is. I mean, it's, we've, we've had to learn from those things. And consequently, we didn't have to just hire a contractor to go do it. And then they hand it over to us. And then we have no idea how it works. So at least we have an idea of how it got installed, where it got placed, why it got put up, you know, the whole nine yards. And, and just really having that team around it that embraces that, that is like, hey, we're, we're totally willing to do whatever we need to do, I think has been huge for us over the years. Yeah, and it's one of those things where you know we've we've interviewed a, a number of lists and just talking to people in general, and you're like, well, where does the success come from? And it's never really, oh, well, we were well funded, so we could do it, or we're we're the best at technology, we have the smartest, whatever. It's it really boils down to we had the team, we put a team together, and we got it done. And it's not always beautiful or glorious, but I mean, any organization that runs well is based on the team and keeping a good team and. You know, even if they don't own it, they 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 have ownership to the what they're doing, and I think that's how you really build something that scales and it'll be organic and will stay out there versus something that you're just looking to turn and burn and push on to some other sucker, right? Yeah, so. we've never really had that been to that position where it's been like, hey, here here's a ton of money and just go build something amazing. You know, we we had to kind of be scrappy about it, and I think it kind of taught us some good lessons that you know were were important for us to build a really solid foundation for our company. And it allows us, you know, a little more flexibility around that. We're not beholden to anybody really, you know, so not that we don't, you know, have our fair share of, of situations where we've borrowed money for things and whatever, but, you know, they were under our terms and not somebody else's terms. And so it's been, I guess, sort of refreshing in that regard. Um, there are days I'm kind of like, you know what, selling out may not be too bad, but uh, I, I wake <laughs> up the next day and think, you know what, that's okay. We can, we can get through this, whatever the challenge is, you know, we've, you know, we're, we're fortunate to be able to help other people with, with when they've had, you know, big issues um, and just paving that way to, to, you know, I guess, paying it forward a little bit and hoping that those returns come back to you eventually, you know? Yep. Like, I'm out. And it's like, are you really out or do you just need a sandwich, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, my sugar's is low, so... <laughs> Uh, okay. So cool. So, um, what was, oh, the propagation. So when you're planning your sites, you're looking at your propagation, your RF mapping, your non-line site, what are you guys using for that right now? Cause I know that question comes up a lot. Um, f- honestly, we've kind of been fortunate that one of our employees that we hired had a copy of path loss. So we do the majority of our point to point planning and path loss, um, which is kind of cool. 
uh, I, I guess it, you know, it feels as official as it can be, um, as far as having a real tool behind it. But, you know, in the past, we've used a little bit of everything. I still pop into the ubiquity design tool every now and then, or whatever, whatever they call it today. And, and just to say, okay, if I put a sector here and it kind of, what's it going to cover? You know, it just gives me a great idea of what, what that may, may actually cover, um, at least theoretically, right? Um, and, uh, I think we were longtime users of, um, tower coverage, um, we not so much anymore. We've kind of, we don't, we, the, 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 some of the stuff that we use that were that like where we were doing, bringing in the leads through our website, through their system, we stopped using a while back. And so we've kind of gotten away from using some of that. And we were using other tools because of all the fiber and cable to do all of our FCC submissions. So, so we've got other tools. So regulatory solutions does some stuff for us to, you know, submit those things. And then they've got some qualification tools that we've used as well over the years. But um, if, if it's out there, we've probably tried it. Um, I know Jonathan, my other network guy, uses the Cambium link planner quite a bit too when we're messing with Cambium stuff. We've deployed some six gig point to point, which has been super great, um, at least for now. Hopefully, um, hopefully it stays that way a little bit longer and doesn't just get trashed like five gigahertz does. Uh, EIRP limitations do kind of stink, but you know, when you need a three or four mile shot to do a point to point to a tower, it's actually been pretty great for us. We've done some point to point to multi point that's been good. And I think he's planned all that in the Cambium link planner since we've done it all with Cambium gear. But you name it, we've probably touched it at some point in time. Um, but path loss is probably our go to for, you know, we do all of our license link planning and all that kind of stuff. It's really, really a great tool. I wish it didn't cost so much, but <laughs> it's, it's a great yeah. tool. What what about like CN what's a CN heat or something like that that shows you the uh... yeah so we've done all, all of our three gigahertz uh, mapping uh, for coverage you know and CN heat it's been good um, in fact we've done just recently had a big project with the city of Amarillo where we we ran a bunch of stuff through uh, CN heat I kind of forget about it Jonathan does all that for me so I don't really <laughs> I don't really get into it very much but they had uh, like seven sites around town that they wanted to get coverage on for an intersection project so we threw them all in there and they basically gave us coverage for the whole town based on on those seven sites and you know we're gonna we're, we're actually gonna probably end up throwing some stuff at Toronto for that that project possibly and they're gonna map it in their stuff but yeah see and heat's a good is a good tool I mean their their lidar data is great yeah that's that's uh, the key point there that uh, uh, the way that lidar data works seems to be pretty damn accurate as far as like you know what? Scarily, what, I mean, yeah. We did a three what? gig one where we would deploy to three gig radio, and we're like, "Well, see, heat says it's going to be this," and it was real questionable, yeah. Like what the signal was going to be, whether or not we could service it. And we went there, and it was spot on. It's exactly yeah. what it was supposed to be. I was like, "Okay, that was kind of cool." Yeah, not, not only like the coverage of the house, but like what corner of the house is the best place to put the antenna and stuff like that. It's it's crazy. And if you and I have access to that, what does everybody else, you know, yeah, with exactly. a three letter word, you know, in their <laughs> yeah. or acronym in their name, yeah. have access to? So it's mm-hmm. pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw the Google Network Planner just recently announced that they're yep. dropping their service. So I know that conversation has around been back up as everyone's like, we've got four months to figure out how to, to do our planning because so many relied on this. So yep. there's another thing. Don't necessarily base your whole business relying around Google services that are available because it should it could just go one day. So. Well, any yep. one service, well, right? I mean, it doesn't matter who it is. Uh, manufacturers, I mean, how many manufacturers have we seen come and go out of the industry over the last 10 or 12 years? Um, yeah. Where they have a good product, it looks cool on the surface, maybe, and then they're gone a few years later. Um, not not to mention any names by any means, but it's. Uh, I think that's kind of why I've been okay with kind of having a, a what I, I've always kind of called a hybrid, you know, network. Not even just in technology, but in vendor, you know, because yeah. you put all of your eggs in one basket, and that the vendor vendor goes tits up. Yeah, what are you going to do then? How do yeah. you, how they, do you continue to service your customer? Yeah, or they stop producing next generation stuff, and you're just stuck with the old stuff, and it becomes outdated, even though they might support it well. It's like, yeah, yep. So we 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 we, we spread the love around on the design side of it. I'd never, I never. It's kind of interesting. I used. The, I was pulled into a focus group for the Google. Uh, Network mapping planning. stuff, yeah, whatever yeah. they call it, and but we never really used it. it uh, they like here, here's a login, try it out, let us know what you think. And then I sat on a call with the, like four or five people from Google. They asked me a bunch of questions, and I was like, "Here's my, here's what I think of it," you know. And that was like it before it was even in beta, or right as it was going into beta. But then after that, we never really used it for anything. I didn't even know it was really that well used. But uh, it makes me glad I'm with Federated on the SaaS side of things because I heard some comments about them saying that you know. The, the Google SaaS might be the next thing to go. Who knows, you know? Yeah. And uh, that'll be a nice transition that a lot of people will probably have to make because what, there's only two now, Federated and Google, right? Yeah. So, yeah, because yeah, yeah, Comsco the, the, got out. And, yeah. The Google Network Planner always seemed clunky to me. 
and it was really finicky. Like you had to do it uh, in a, a very in a certain way for it to flow. Otherwise, it would just it wouldn't map, or it was just weird the way it works. So I don't know. I guess I just I can't even up. remember what all the details were. It was a couple of years ago, maybe three yeah. or four years ago, when I, I even looked at haven't looked at it since then, but. I guess it's fine. You know, to me, if everybody complains about Google, you know, sunsetting products or whatever, but uh, I mean, at least they're doing stuff. You know, yeah. I mean, for sure, they, for sure. They take what works and they keep that and they'll toss out the rest of it. I, yeah. I, don't, I mean, the one, I don't the hate one that. cool thing about Google was that it, it really reached out to all the antenna manufacturers out there, right? And was able to put this huge repository of all the antenna files in order, you know, so you can go into it. Like I said, if you, for instance, use Ubiquity, right? You just have Ubiquity's antennas in there, right? You don't have everybody else's, right? I mean, of course, that's a vendor specific, so you don't ex- necessarily expect them to add uh, everybody else's antennas, right? But I mean, there was no other tool that was that uh, detailed, let's say, with all the antenna files that you can pick and stuff like that. So that was pretty cool. Okay. And then there's so much other like data crunching, like all the GIS stuff, and especially like all that with the fiber, I'm sure, is very very uh you know, entertaining and stuff but then you've got all the regulatory paperwork and all your bdc stuff and everything that you've got to handle and i think a lot of people don't realize you know again as they build up and scale is just how much of that sort of ancillary paperwork and data crunching and stuff you have to do so there's there's a lot of it out there today for sure yeah, we have a full-time guy that does all of our fiber designing and uh a lot of the like he's responsible for the splice crew um, and then we've got a guy that all he does is all the GIS stuff. I mean, that's uh, we were trying to spread it out across people, and we found that it wasn't getting done. Things weren't getting documented and recorded correctly. And then, of course, don't even don't even mention the fact that it was designed one way, but actually installed a different way, you know. And so, uh, keeping up with all those changes and whatnot has been a challenge. And so, we finally, as we were looking at stuff about a year ago, we were like, you know, we need to really eliminate this position. And we found that that person worked really well in this other position. They wanted to sit behind a computer screen and and uh, not really have to deal with customers and don't even really have to deal with a lot of employees very much. And it worked out good because we hopefully got a, somebody to keep us on top of our our, our mapping. And then we've got, um, you know, somebody who, an employee who's happier now because they're not having to deal with customers all day long, you know, because they were in support previously. So it's quite a, quite a change to go from answering a support telephone call to somebody who's just responsible for mapping. But I'm proud that, to say that we, we generated a lot of our own tools, um, in house for some of our mapping. We've got a, my systems guy actually is pretty good at putting together stuff. And so we've got a lot of our own custom mapping that we do for our fiber stuff and and we're constantly improving on those things to try to keep track of our art off obligations also our competitors art off obligations and if you know things come and go we can look at a single point kind of and say hey let's turn on this layer and look at you know this and look to compare it with this and figure out kind of what our next moves are and so um, luckily we've been able to get to a size where we have enough resources and people to handle those things we're not just dependent on throwing it out to somebody and hoping that what they give you back is accurate we can really i guess do more legwork on um, keeping that data accurate. And then if we come back and say, oh, I don't really like this, or hey, what if you added this? They can just do it instead of us going through a whole other process of sending it back to somebody. Now, I'm sure there's a cost, you know, like we probably pay more in labor for uh, those same things um, than if we were just farming it out to somebody because we're paying it all the time, 24-7, 365, right? But I feel like, again, just like we talked earlier, when I, we have we do everything basically in-house, it's just... It makes sense to us. I want to be able to walk in and talk to somebody and say, "Hey, let's make this change, and we can just do it." No, no big crazy, you know. Put an email together and send it off to somebody. Six meetings later, hope you get what you want. You know, that's that's just not me. I don't like that kind of work. Yeah. So, yeah the uh, the data management outside plant. I did a tour of duty in college uh, with AT and T uh, outside plant engineering and stuff, and people don't realize just how onerous it is to, to stay up with all that paperwork. Cause again, it's something you lay the fiber down, you run your strands or whatever. You're like, great, it's done. But then you've got to go back at some point, you're going to have to come back and find where the handhole is or your splice cabinet or, you know, where all these things are. And if you're not staying on top of that, you're going to end yourself uh, in a world of hurt real quick. Well, God forbid 811 requests come through for somebody else. Now you're trying to mark your own stuff. And you're like, I don't even know where my stuff is. You know, I mean, we've, we've seen some of that. We've had a little bit of that. Luckily, you know, not a lot, but we, we learned pretty quickly that those are important things to stay on top of. Yeah. The regulatory side, I'm glad I don't have a lot to do with anymore. Uh, those kind of gotten farmed out to other people too, but gosh, I mean, just 
just between keeping up with where you put stuff and, and all the regulatory side of it, it's it's a lot of work. I uh, I don't I, I feel for a lot of the smaller guys out there that are having to keep up with this stuff, and I'm glad that there are vendors out there who will help them with that. Um, and we use some of them too, just because you know it's a lot, but it's uh, it's still a lot of internal paper pushing to keep up with all that kind of stuff and. I don't know if that's intentional, you know, whether or not you want to believe the government's, you know, trying to make it harder for small business to operate or not, and 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 those kinds of things. That's a different discussion, probably. Or if, um, you know, it's just kind of the way the cookies crumbled, but it's a lot of work. There's just always the aspect of just complicated. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, you build a big thing and it takes a lot, a lot of little pieces to keep that going. Now, you know, as your, your fiber journey has expanded and grown, I mean, would you say that's been the bigger challenging side, the data and the management of that sort of stuff? Or has it been just the learning how to do the physical work and the splicing or, you know, what's been the, the biggest sort of learning curve struggles for you guys? Have you, have you started building out your fiber plant? I think it's like everything. Um, you know, we if you would have asked me ten years ago, you know, there would have been a huge learning curve on the wireless side. And so you asked me today, and our, our wireless almost feels easy most days. We, oh yeah, I can do this and that, and just kind of you know go along with it. So yeah, certainly the physical side of it was a learning curve. But we hired you know people that knew what they were doing at least just to some extent, um, and uh, were able to get that ball rolling. But I think we've had more of a more of a challenge with you know keeping up with the 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 mapping side of it and just getting p- cable placed in the right spots and then permitting. Luckily, we're in an area where there you know permitting is a a huge deal. Like we're, we're typically building in the counties, and so they're pretty easy to work with. Um, and XL Energy has got the majority of the power poles around here, but we do cross over to some co-op poles and windstream poles and whatever. And so navigating those things has probably been one of the bigger challenges. Um, I was just, uh, Casey Imgarten was just here to, to get some equipment uh, last week and he's like, permits? What are those? You know, so they're just running, you know, they're just running down the road in, in Missouri, you know, plowing fiber in, just, you know, blazing a path. And I'm like, well, it's not quite that easy here, but luckily we don't have a huge uh, um, uh, burden on that side of it. But there, there is still some, you know, uh, even if that just means getting a county, you know, commissioner to say, yeah, as long as you're following the, you know, the, the road guys, you know, requirements for depth and yada, 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 we, we're fine, you know, what's the keep up with where your stuff is and that's all we really care about but then there's xl energy and your permitting poles and then going back and forth with them to try to say okay well we need make ready on that pole and they want thirty thousand dollars for it well that i guess we're going underground you know so now your design has changed and you know those kinds of stuff have probably been pr- the majority of where our time gets wasted if we could just build you know we could we were able to get th- get through that in a in a pretty quickly um I guess prior to that, it was probably the funding to get the equipment to start the fiber builds. You know, yeah, that was that was a, l- a little bit challenging to figure out how do you how do you buy you know boring rigs and water trucks and splice trailers and trucks and <laughs> no, it's all yeah. incredibly expensive. And yeah. I mean, we've got millions of dollars wrapped up in it today. And again, I feel sorry for the small guys who just they can't obtain that kind of funding. And we were only able to do it probably really out of happenstance to some extent. You know, like we just hit at the right time, you know, or early enough in the time. Like the money's just not a plenty anymore like it was. It's definitely with interest rates being up and things. Uh-huh. I mean, it's it's a different ball game today. Yeah. And in fact, that was a good conversation I had with Casey while he was here. It's like Things today, the way we operate today, are not like they were 10 years ago. Completely different landscape. It is not nearly as easy to operate today as it was 10 years ago. You know, we saw massive growth. We're still growing, but it is is a lot slower. I mean, so much more competition out there for the likes of Starlink and Verizon and T-Mobile and everybody else who's getting into the game. You know, it's it's a different animal today. Yeah, I mean, that was an aside. No, no. I mean, that's a really important part, a really important consideration. You know, you're always riding that knife edge between growth and ROI sustainability. You know, when you're trying to make that shift from doing a two to six month ROI versus a realistic one to two year ROI, whether it be fiber or a Toronto or something like that, you know, where it's, you know, a, a definitely step up in what your your capex is going to be, and then you know, can you survive that? You know, all the growth in the world is great, but if you run out of money, <laughs> or you can't, <laughs> your cash if your cash flow can't support it, you know, uh, or you're just running in the red for so long, you know, these are all important considerations, and there's no one 
footprint that says so much like with the permits and stuff like that, you know, where one outfit, they're like, oh yeah, fiber's pretty easy and I get a one year ROI. And then some areas where they're having to do, you know, environmental studies because trenching will disturb a, a, a turtle habitat or something like that. And it takes a year and a half to get the permits done. Like how much money have you just pissed away waiting on that? So yep. again, it's not a common thing. You know, you get to hear, oh, this is easy or that's impossible. And there's just so many colors of gray, like everything else. It's exactly right. Yeah. And I, and I was having that same conversation with Matt Larson a couple of weeks ago when we were traveling through, I got to visit him. Um, he's basically in the same boat. The, the landscape is just different. IS, the ISP world is different today than it was. And, um, I think it's, it's good and it's bad to some extent. In other words, what I guess what I'm really getting at is it's, it's good to have the challenge to, to, you know, it gets monotonous doing the same thing over and over and over. It might be easier to make money that way, but you know, you, it's, it's kind of fun to, to do something different, but at the same time, it's also frustrating because you're like, I just feel like I got a groove and I figured out how to do something <laughs> and now I'm having to change. And whether that's a forced change or that's just the way the industry, you know, you're in your customer base is drug you. I mean, like for us, you know, getting hundred plus meg speed packages to people, whether that's on wireless cable or fiber, um, you know, because that's what people want, whether they need it or not. We can have this conversation around, do you need a hundred megs or a gigabit or whatever it is, but that's what they want. And so you got to figure out how to accommodate both those things. And it's just, it's, it's a tough challenge at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, it's, and it's for the, the WISP, you know, the, the operators and stuff. I mean, the equipment manufacturers are in a similar spot too, right? You know, we're seeing this big shift. The customer base is shifting, the the technology set and then waiting on tech to kind of get there and you know we everyone was so used to having major technology upgrades every two or three years right and now that that pattern has gotten a lot more mature so you know there's a lot of like well we're just waiting for the next big thing and it's like well you're kind of in it or you know you've got to think about what you're realistically doing and you know there's a, a lot of uncertainty across the whole marketplace as a whole it's like okay what are we doing what are we waiting on is six going to be the next biggest thing or is vendor y or manufacturer z so you know yeah it's never every easy. day's a new day that's what i always say that's what i always tell people like the way we talk about the weather around here in the panhandle like if you don't like it just wait five minutes and i kind of <laughs> feel like that's some so, sort of the case some days in in this whole isp industry is you know if you don't like something give it a year it'll be completely different yeah, and yeah. you can either be willing to roll with the punches for that, or you know, you can just keep doing what you're doing and probably get left behind. You know, exactly. Yeah. So, but like everything else, right? If it was easy to do, then everyone would be doing it. So, if we if we had a print money machine, I think we'd all be on our yachts or you know <laughs> something like that. Still so. looking for one of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> had to RMA is so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, you broke it. Yeah, uh, yeah. It. sorry, my bad, my bad. <laughs> um, so, in your fiber stuff, are you mostly aerial, just because of the ruralness and the the terrain that you're in, or is it a mix of underground and aerial, or what does it look like there? Yeah, the majority of our of our network would be considered aerial. We've really only done underground, or we have to, um, just because. Like we bought a plow, a big a big dozer plow, and uh, started trying to use it, and we just we could we couldn't make use of it, and so it was like okay, unless we're going to commit to um, boring everything in underground, which some people do around here. I mean, they're doing three four hundred foot shots, just you know, going down the road, and uh, yep. it's because they want it underground, and and that's smart. There's certainly nothing wrong with that, but yeah, the majority of our of our plant is aerial, which comes with this you know uh, a particular set of consequences you know if there was a tornado or even just we get 60 70 mile hour winds around here broken poles and sh- bullet holes you know whatever the case may be um but uh we we do have a significant you know portion of it that is underground but it's typically out of necessity more than anything um but luckily really excel energy is pretty pretty reasonable to work with um and their pole costs aren't too bad you know when you run across a co-op that wants 15 or 25 dollars a year per pole instead of the four to six dollars we're paying you know on other ones that starts to add up in a hurry i mean just our pole attachment fees alone are significant we're talking nearly six figures a year just for our pole attachment fees wow um so you trade one cost for another probably really probably over the long run but man aerial is so much faster to deploy i mean we can we can run circles around the underground crews with the aerial guys. So, definitely, like I said, it's a, it's a balance. You know, we want to get those customers installed, as, you know, those areas covered in fiber as quickly as possible. That's the way to do it. But there's a limit. There's a there's an element of risk there that you've got to be prepared for. 
And uh, like when we had that fiber cut the other or that bullet outage the other night, <laughs> you know, having the, the people available to be able to resolve it in a timely manner so that you didn't have 75 people offline for days or whatever, you know, yeah. it's important. You got yep. that, you've got the weekend drunks running into the poles, you know, that's yep. a common, that's a common story. So, um, are you doing, are you doing all G-Pon or are you doing any active? Yeah, the, or? yeah 99% of what we're doing is G-Pon. I don't know why anybody would would design a completely active network, you know, in this day and age. I mean, Pawn is just, uh, in my opinion, superior to it. I mean, I've seen some of these videos on, on YouTube where, you know, entire towns or counties do active networks and I'm just thinking, holy cow, how... You know, and they've got racks and racks of switches go, you know, with individual fibers running at everybody. I'm just like, that just doesn't make sense to me. But, you know, hey, if they made it work, they made it work. That's cool. But yeah, Pawn is really the name of our game. And um, we're we're running a lot of XGS Pawn. You know, it's kind of like if we're going to build it, you might as well be ready for the next thing. And we actually have a couple two and a half gig customers that are on our service. And um, there's not a big push for it. But I was actually at, uh, watching a podcast just uh, Matt Larson was on one, I don't know, a couple of days ago. And I was just kind of listening into it while I was working, and and one of the one a couple of the operators on there were doing, I guess, five and maybe ten gig plans to customers, and they're like, "We know they can't use it; they can't even begin to to touch that amount of you know download capacity or whatever, but they want it and they'll pay for it. So we're gonna sell it to them. Uh, we're not quite on that train yet. I got a lot. I I feel like I'm behind the curve most of the time, just trying to keep the core network running enough to run gigabit <laughs> speeds, not much less you know multi gigabit. But we do have a few in the right in the right places. Uh, but that's a coming thing that I don't think people maybe fully grasp just yet. And I think maybe we didn't completely grasp for a little while that that you know that's what people want, whether they can use it or need it. That's a different conversation. So yeah, pawn is our is our is our thing. You just put fiber in the ground and it's infinite bandwidth all the time. I mean, yeah. you just make Unlimited. the light. Yeah, you just make the light go faster, right? So yeah, <laughs> it's, that's exactly how it works. Yeah, uh, it just takes it just takes a lot of money to get it there. <laughs> Pixie could, dust and whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, magic fairy kisses. So yeah, okay. Um, so that's cool. That's cool. So and I guess we've got Wispapalooza. It's coming up here very very soon. So. Yeah, I think the excitement level is is building up. It's always like before the show, you're like, okay, here we go again. Then you get there, and it's like, all right, this is this is cool. We're cool, cool. Got all the all the hard work out of the way, right? Now you just got to yeah, show yeah. up and get it done. Well, we're 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 excited because we're um you know we're we're actually have a booth there for our safety stuff, and um uh we've got a new booth going on, and so there's excitement there, trying to figure out how to make that more efficient and, and whatnot, and so there's been a lot of excitement on our side, just like, hey, we're actually, we feel like we're maybe kind of growing up in that space a little bit. We're not <laughs> not having to do everything ourselves. We can buy a, a nice, you know, shippable booth and can send it to the site, and, you know, you guys know how that, that whole thing works, yes. you know. You've, ha- you've got to deal with that, um, but I'm kind of excited just on a personal note, you know, I mean, this whole 20-year thing for Wispa is super cool, <laughs> but, you know, I'm always excited to come see uh, all, all of our friends and, and hang out and talk but just i think the twice a year that we hit those shows and even fispa kind of fits in there too is when you get in a group of people and you can really have a good conversation with somebody and you pick up that one nugget of information that's typically what it is for me is like i never thought about that or hey that's an interesting take on this and you take that home and you 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 act on it you know we want to act like we have all of our stuff together all the time right (laughs) but we really don't and and we just it's all a facade right for the most part that you go and you hang around people who are struggling with the same crap that you're struggling with and then you you get that nugget and you bring it home and it kind of rekindles that fire and you're like okay i'm ready to go again for another round and uh and i legitimately feel that twice a year like i love wisp america and i love wisp palooza even as much as we're getting in transition into fiber i mean there's still our you know our favorite shows to go to and we've gone to other ones you know that are are good but maybe just don't have quite the energy and so yeah it's always for me it's like i feel like this is my recharge period where i can i can go and do something a little bit different get away from the day-to-day grind maybe a little bit hang out with some people i like and talk about you know tech and whatever that is whether it's business or the or the legitimate you know technical side of it um and hope that i can maybe give somebody a nugget and i want my goal is to always pick up a nugget from somebody else even if it's just a little one nuggets we're gonna be passing out nuggets uh at whisper that's little nuggets here's your nugget Here's your nugget. Here's your... Okay, yeah. Little gold nuggets, exactly. Exactly. 
That, that's awesome. That's 100%. I mean, it's something we've always said for years. And, you know, everyone else, we usually would do a, a, a thing right before the show. Um, but, no, I think that encapsulates it perfectly. You know, you're not going to find another group of like-minded individuals who are fighting the same problems that you're fighting and have maybe come up with different solutions or new ways to look at stuff yes. or, you know, or you at least sit there and have a beer and cry over the same thing, right? You've got a shoulder to lean on, so... Yep. Well, you know, it's like I tell people um, on and off over the years, people are like, ah, I'm not going to join WISPA. I don't like what they stand for or whatever. And I'm like, but they're the only people standing for you. Yeah. And exactly. even if you don't like everything that WISPA does, it, well, I, yeah. I don't know of anything that you know, for anybody that I always like everything that they do. You know, it's, a, it's sort of a balance. But if yeah. anything, to me, and maybe some people don't need this, and, and I didn't realize I needed it probably until four, five, six years ago myself, is, but that recharge period of just, you know, getting around like minded people. I mean, it's all fine and well to have, you know, Facebook conversations and maybe talk to somebody on the phone every now and then, but, you know, disconnecting a little bit and going and hanging out with your buddies, having good conversations around stuff and building that next level, I think it's, it's been pivotal for us to some extent. And I think unless you experience it, uh, anybody who says they've gone to any show, doesn't matter whether it's a Whisper show or FISPA or whatever, and says, ah, I didn't really get anything out of it, that's your fault. Yeah. You didn't You didn't engage somebody properly. Correct. Um, and it, you can't just blame it on everybody else, I feel like. And, and um, I, I've tried to keep that in the forefront of my mind, and even that's why I like helping um, with the sessions. You know, a lot of people kind of like, ah, eh, the sessions or, or whatever. And you may not get a ton out of an individual session, but you're you may get that nugget out of that session session, or you may realize, Oh, Hey, I want to go talk to that person now. And now you kind of build that connection. And then it just really flourishes from there. And maybe people are different, but that's, I feel like it's just been super huge for me. And, and, and also I like to, to, to participate in those things as a way to help give back, even if it's just a little nugget. Yeah, definitely. It's always, it's always been about the personal connections for me uh, and, uh, the ability to talk, uh, with people who are doing the same thing you are. Right. So it's never been about necessarily the sessions or what WISPA does. It's just that, that, that one-on-one time that you can get with, you know, other like-minded people that are doing the same things that I've, I've always found so valuable, uh, in it. And yeah, it's, it's a, it's a great part of it. So it's, 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 it's a new way of looking at it. Definitely. You know, for sure. And I, and I'm super, you know, uh, I love seeing all the vendors and get to hang out and see their stuff. You know, like that to me is, um, I know a couple of my guys, you know, were, um, who've never been to a show, but they've heard us talk about it or they've used XYZ vendors equipment for years and years and years. And I drag them to a show and I'm like, Hey, this is the guy that owns that company. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whatever it is, you know, or this, you know, this is my buddy at, you know, uh, Aviat, you know, whatever, you know, and they're like, Oh, Hey, now there's a personal connection there. They yep. feel like they're kind of tied into the connection. And I don't, I don't know. I mean, for me, that's kind of huge, you know, like, I mean, not that I'm going to, and I've done this, but I try not to, but you know, like maybe I've called Ken from Aviat and said, dude, I'm in a, I'm in a pickle, you know? Yeah. And even if he can't help me, he can help me get to the right person. You know, this was literally like one of those Saturday mornings you wake up with an oh, uh, oh crap, hair on fire situation. Those personal connections, man, they go a long way. Even if they're not the person, at least you're that much closer. And like, so I like hanging out with you guys and other vendors that, you know, if I, I get a pickle, I'm like, man, I need to call in a favor on this. I, at least you feel like you can. And I hope yeah. people, you know, feel the same way back toward us in, in some way. Definitely. It's important to have a good relationship, be liked. And, you know, like I said... Uh, oh, just, people have to like you? Damn. Yeah. <laughs> that might be a problem for me. <laughs> tolerate, tolerate, success. Tolerate, tolerate. tolerate. Okay, 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 sorry. Okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but... Yeah. I mean, yeah, for us as manufacturers, too, I mean, you know, it's great to see everyone hang out and have a good time. But, I mean, it's also very much a reminder of why we do what we do, right? You know, we get stuck in the same sort of ruts that y'all do and everything. It's mm-hmm. like, okay. Yeah. And, and then you meet people or, yeah, some cat you've never really talked to. And they're like, hey, I'm from such and such wireless. We've got, you know, 500 of these things. We love it. We just want to tell you thanks. And I was like, oh, hell yeah. This is this is why we do this. Like, exactly. Yeah, so exactly. Your- well, I would like to think that you guys have an awesome product. I know you do. But, you know, your, your relationships and the, what you guys put out and for the industry as a whole. I mean, it's got to help you guys' bottom line in the long run, too. I mean, I love it when I see a vendor putting out, you know, informational vid- videos not even just about their product but just about how the technology works in general like you guys have talked about propagation and, and other things you know like that's sort of the ubiquity form 
uh, of 10 years ago for some of us, you know, they're yeah. now it's like, what can I find on YouTube and YouTube university something and learn? And the, the vendors are in a very interesting situ- uh, position in order to be able to share that information and have the resources to put out something that looks good. And I love it. I am, I am all for it. I love it. Every time I see a vendor who puts out good information, even somewhat neutral information, you know, about just a general RF topic or the way equipment works, routing, whatever. Um, and if they sprinkle their own stuff in there, that's great too. You know, I mean, uh, but I think those are, those are the key things that the industry continues to need is this more information, um, educating people on all those kinds of stuff. And, and those personal connections, uh, they've, they've got to pay off. At least I hope they do. I know they do for us to some extent. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is why we do the podcast. At first it was, you know, just kind of an advertising like I mean, not really. You know, we've always wanted to be educational, but that's why the format has changed to be what it is now where we're just like, look, we're not here to teach. We're here to learn and because otherwise, you know, when we first started, I'm like, oh, sit there and watch an hour of myself on the camera. I'd rather go like lay in the street, right? <laughs> watch so, paint dry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, nobody's nobody's signing into this for the yeah. views, right? But um, yeah, yeah. But no, this is this is why we like to help, and I think it, it does a lot for us in the community. And I mean, I don't know. I think it's interesting. So, but on that note, uh, we can sit here and, and and flap our gums for hours and hours but i think this is a good point to sort of wrap it up here i think we've covered a lot of good stuff about you know the tech side the business and growth side which is super important and uh the show and everything so i feel really good now uh if there's anyone looking out there to to get in touch with you they want to ask you any questions or anything like that you know feel free to to put your info out there and make yourself available as you want it here i don't know best way for someone to track you down or not <laughs> probably find me find me on facebook honestly i i do pay attention to linkedin a little bit uh so you can find me you know by searching for my name um uh happy to help anybody as as i can i get a lot of direct messages from people and uh sometimes not always super prompt on responding to them but uh, always always willing to, to help as best i can or at least point in the right direction very good awesome Tasa says where can people find us yeah, you can find us all over social media as well, all the Facebook groups. Uh, come see us at Wispapalooza. We'll be in booth 540. That's 540. Come see our new wideband products. We have even more products that you haven't seen yet that we'll be showing there at the show. So come visit us there. And, of course, you can always find us on our website, rfelements.com. All right, everyone. So until we talk to you again next time, y'all be good out there. Bye. Peace. See ya. <laughs> 